Restoring the Future, the third round table in the Anthropocene Transition Network series, Regenerative Strategies for the Anthropocene Transition. Welcome to this, the third round table in the series, Restoring the Future. I'm your host, Ken McLeod, coming to you from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the land on which the city of Sydney now stands. This series brings together four leading regeneration practitioners, global permaculture educator and urban agriculture pioneer, Morag Gamble, regenerative culture author, educator, researcher and activist, Daniel Christian Wall, regenerative urban planner, developer, educator and animateur, Jason Twill, and tonight's discussion leader, Australian Indigenous cultural ecologist, Chels Marshall. But before I introduce Chels, I'd like to invite you to pause with me for a moment to consider the immense privilege, opportunity and responsibility those of us here in Australia have in sharing this vast continent with the oldest surviving culture on the planet. Indigenous Australians have cared for this land for at least 60,000 years, going on 120,000. They have lived through the last ice age and seen the seas rise to flood the coastal plains and river valleys in the early years of the Holocene. Having lived on this land sustainably for countless generations, they now face, with us all, the existential threats of the Anthropocene. I'd like to acknowledge their success in living sustainably, adapting to immense environmental upheavals, developing cultural traditions and land management practices finely attuned to the custodianship of this land, and surviving the ravages and ongoing deprivations of European colonialism over the last 250 years. Please join me in honouring their singular achievements and their elders past, present and to come. So now to our topic for this round table, re-indigenizing the future or imply applying earth-centric eco-cultural values for a post-growth world. As is our practice in this series, Shells will open up tonight's round table con conversation and then invite our other guests to take up the themes of her opening remarks. It's indeed a pleasure to invite Chels to, to begin tonight's discussion. Over to you. Before I go into things, I'd just like to acknowledge um, uh, the Gumbangi people's totem. I'm Gumbangi. I'm from the um, north coast, east coast of Australia. Um, and in Gumbangi country, our totem is the ocean. It's the, the life force um, and it's the spiritual force of what makes me, makes me who I am and what makes our culture and our community what they are um, with the strength and with the healing components of the ocean. Um, I need to give respect um, firstly and also as one of our major life sources and what I like to call one of the primary um, organs of the planet. And um, so welcome everyone to tonight. Um, I think how I'll start is um, I'll, I'll open with a, a story. Um, it's a story that I was told when I was young um, and it's all, you know, it's all very ocean centric. Um, but it, it's, 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 it's like a series and, and part series of, of, of a story and a storyline. It's related to the Gane sisters which are the Gawana sisters, which are the two women that, that made the sea and made the coastline. So with their Gane sticks, their digging sticks, they made the ocean. It's a, it's a fantastic story. story. It's, you know, it's, it's way better than like a Mills and Boons. There's uh, lots of drama in there. There's, you know, there's a murder. 
uh, there's a mystery, there's poison, um, you know, um, there's you know, a little bit of sort of uh, sexual uh, sort of connotation and you know, it's just jam-packed full of, you know, all these life experience things. But essentially it's the two sisters that the older sister and the younger sister that made the coastline. They also made the north and the south winds. Um, so the stronger, bigger sister went south, which is why we get the stronger winds from the south. And the younger sister went north, which is the north wind, which are the, the smaller uh, winds and the, the playful winds. They're the ones that also bring in things like blue, bear, blue bottles and all those sort of things that come in. So a bit tricky, a bit playful as younger sisters are. They now sit up in the sky as part of the Seven Sisters star constellation, uh, the, the two last stars in the Pallades. Um, and they essentially sit there and remind us of the role that females have in maintaining ocean law and ceremony and the reasons why women have integrated and integral roles in the, in the management of our planet and the environment and in the protection and associated responsibilities for looking after our planet and, and particularly the ocean. The next part of that story when the sea started to rise is about the, the koala brothers. It's also a story about Garuja, the whale, the Dungia Gagus, the koala brothers, Balinjin, the quoll, and it's, 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 a con it's part of that continuing epic yeah, second component to the making of the sea with the Gano sisters, and it's sort of associated to like a five-part series. It's almost sort of verging on Game of Thrones type stuff as you start connecting and moving along. But um, this story in particular was 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 written with my kin sister, um, Shah Smith, in 2019, and I think it was so summing of. Yeah, what I was trying to do on my PhD that I included it as my last paragraph in my PhD. So I'll give it a go. So it was, it was the start of the story is basically from an act of violence um, against the sacredness of life and country. And it resulted in the two Goanna sisters making the sea. So this violence was where uh, a, a man or another entity was trying to take the life of these two sisters. So the land became flooded and the people who were far out on the ocean fishing became cut off from the homeland. They took refuge on top of a hilltop and asked the koala brothers if they could use their intestines to make a bridge back to the homeland. And if you have a look, I don't know if there's any ecologists out there, but if you have a look at the intestine of a koala, you have a look on it, and there's all these little um, markings that look like footprints. It's, it's really cool. So all the people were on the bridge making their way back to, to the land when the mischievous Bellingen, the eastern quoll. So there's a, there's a town up here called Bellingen, and that's derived from the name Balogen, the, the place of the quoll. So Balogen stood and was, was filling them with fear. So what he was doing was making the waves bigger and you know, freaking them out and threatening to chop down the bridge, you know, starting to really make things hairy and frighten everyone with this changing sort of coastline and this rising sea. He continued his mischievousness by calling on the huge sea creature, Garuja, the whale, the humpback whale. However, when Garuja was coming, he could see the people were afraid and he felt their fear and reassured them that he was here to help them. And because Garuja, the humpback whale, carries in his huge heart lots of love and respect for all life, for life is sacred. He started singing and his song went straight into the hearts of the people so they were then filled with the same love and respect. And then the people felt strong. They felt encouraged and continued on their way to a drastically changed jogun or landscape. They knew that they would need to listen to country, to hear the new songs and to see the new dances, to see the new animals and the new landscape. 
they would have new responsibilities and new relationships. They would need to make new agreements to be part of that continuation in the sacredness and holiness of all life and to then build again the law belonging to place and to peace. So this story is the Gengen Gundi Managan Binda Juglangma Nayambayu. This means let's build a law belonging to peace and let's set things right for all of us. It's a story that tells of the last sea level rise. It's a story that tells us that we have, we have responsibilities for looking after country. It's a story that reminds us that climate change is real and it's happened over the last 10,000 years, 15,000 years, 35,000 years, and so on. The other components of the story tell of the last sea level rise and the intensity of storms and the changes of the land and the seascape. It reminds us of and warns us of the fear and hysteria that could happen. And it tells us of the whales that started their migration up the East Coast and the love and happiness that they brought with them as they still do today. This story is a reminder, it's a warning and a solution to the consequences of climate change and sea level rise and what we're basically doing on this planet at the moment. So it's about finding that position Oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and uh, we just had a little visitor. Oh. And um, that, yeah, we need to be able to um, come together and, um, yeah, find these solutions and understand these new la landscapes and understand these new processes that are about to happen. So, you know, it's particularly pertinent in this time of uncertain times. You know, we've got global capital, political uncertainty, environmental instability, food insecurity, profound species loss and ecosystem breakdowns. You know, all the natural systems essential to our existence and survival, including the forests, the oceans, the rivers in the air, continue to decline and diminish. They're essentially, you know, the, the planet's in, the, in need of palliative care. And so what do we do? You know, they're, they're too, the, those factors and the unknown factors are too much to ignore or to leave to someone else to fix or deal with. You know, we're now at the point where a mass social paradigm shift through mind frame and actions are required to bring that balance back to that ecocentric thought that um, promote you know, different lifestyles and existence on these landscapes that are changing. So with that, one of those concepts is the integration of Indigenous knowledge systems. And as Ken said from the start, you know, um, many Indigenous cultures throughout the world have lived on this planet sustainably for a very, very long time. And part of that sustainability came with, um, you know, social constructs and law that belong to the earth, where the earth and the processes are put first and in primary position, where everything else around it, including the the economy, trade, um, you know, resource um, partitioning, allocation, all had to be earth centric in their processes in the first instance. It was it's the nexus of that paradigm, putting you know these natural processes first because they're the components that sustain life. And we know that. And so in, in coming through that, it's like, okay, well, if we're putting things together, you know, we're trying to understand sustainability. We're trying to understand, you know, the impacts that we have on this planet. We're trying to understand what we've got left of our resources. You know, we're implementing all these sort of governance structures and legislations, et cetera. So why aren't they working? Why are any of these things working? Why are we still moving into these areas where, you know, we're still seeing excessive loss 
of trees. We're seeing, still seeing excessive loss of species. Our food resources are being reduced. The landscapes that grow our foods are becoming poor. And even sunshine, my puppy doesn't like it either. Um, and so one of the key components is then, okay, let's have a look at a different toolbox. All right. Let's look at cultural paradigms or cultural ideology where you know, everything that is in place comes through climate, landscape and the culture and using these as the, the foundations. It's moving into a space where we need to utilise all systems thinking and emotional intelligence to guide us and you know, alter our human dominated dimension of existence. Um, it's time to move with new ideologies and tools and frameworks to find this you know, new future or this future by design is what I like to call it. So it involves those effective adaptation principles, you know, the planning you know, to use the best available knowledge, whatever its source is, and in the face of climate change and the risks and impacts that you know, remain uncertain and unpredictable, you know, there is a gr growing need to foster this co-production of, of new knowledge sets. And basing those new knowledge sets upon collaborative efforts invol involving you know, Indigenous-based knowledge systems. So this new future by design, you know, what does it look like? You know, what, what can be the benefits in it? So one component is by integrating traditional knowledge systems and in particular traditional knowledge practices. So this worldview and this consciousness can help to recalibrate our future. So it's also part of succession in making the next generation more aware, more ecocentric and with intelligence and holistic solution solving. So using these indigenous frameworks that are, you know, tend really to be more fluid and organic and not focused in on narrow, narrow, narrow perspectives with the inability to adjust and adapt, which is what a lot of our social and governance construct, um, constructs are like at the moment. You know, in the end, you know, this necessity will force innovation and it'll force the use of science, new science and new technology to, to develop, deliver, you know, those mechanisms that we need to, to make us more efficient, you know, and to make us more adaptable. You know, but these innovative solutions and adaptive mechanisms are all useless if only a small percentage of the population and the planet are committed or believe in the practicality of it. Um, so when you, when you look at, you know, these indigenous systems, it's like, okay, what are they like? What are they? Um, and, you know, something that comes really close is the, the regenerative design concept. So that comes close to those, those, those paradigms. But essentially, you know, what it consists of is these, these cultural processes that are holistic, are holistic in their nature. So they derive from an from a earth-based and an earth-centric um, point they put all living systems first, and it also then includes a, a social construct and a law that comes with it that enables people to be able to function and to live within those boundaries of sustainability. And you know, it's sustainability with an indigenous ideology. Um, so, and yeah, that, that also answers some of the questions is why Indigenous people, Aboriginal people, particularly in Australia, have been able to come through these um, yeah, expansive and immense timescales, uh, whereas lots of other Indigenous civilizations and societies throughout the world fell off. And a lot of them fell off because of this dirty word called greed and capitalism and taking too many resources and not being able to manage those resources effectively over time and space. And a lot of this came back to our, um, our social constructs, um, which include things like totism, 
uh, kinship, um, animism, and basic you know, creation ideology. So I think, um, I don't know if I've, I've, I've been talking on a little bit there, but it's trying to form a basis of, you know, that, that, that redesigning and how um, Indigenous uh, paradigms and ideology uh, can be inserted in. Um, you know, and one of those that I talk to people a lot about is um, seasonal um, cycles and traditional seasonal cycles and, and cultural calendars. Um, you know, these, these calendars are constructs that help us understand our seasonality. So, you know, still in Australia being, you know, in the position we are, we're close to the equator. So you don't get the distinct um, variables between um, the four seasons, summer, winter, autumn, spring. So there's these other components within. And I believe that those season, the knowledge of those seasonal cycles and living and operating to those seasonal cycles are part of why we were able to be sustainable and to endure and have resilience through these, these changes. It was complete knowledge and understanding of all the biological functions within plants and the animals that relied on those plants. Complete understanding and knowledge on the weather systems and the weather patterns and everything that's within those um, ecological and, and biological system cycles. And it was through those constructs that it then ordered and guided, you know, um, all the all the social components that, that we live by, uh, the movement, the eating during times when animals are supposed to be eaten and in season. And when you do then start taking animals, you're not taking them during breeding season and, you know, when the um, environmental conditions are not conducive to their existence. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's understanding those interactions between the, the spheres of Earth's um, functional systems. And uh, I might hand over to Morag if she's on. Is she on? Yes. Yeah, because um, one of the fundamentals within that was understanding and having knowledge on plants um, and plants as the primary um, you know, component of food, habitat, shelter for everything else. And then obviously the oxygen and maintaining, um, you know, water cycles and clean water and food cycles and food processes. And unfortunately, I missed the talk we had the other week on the agriculture stuff. But, um, yeah, it's, um, I think, you know, Morag um, will be able to follow on here of where, you know, that, that, system of, of understanding plants um, is, is you know, central to understanding how we live on this planet. It's our food, it's our oxygen, it, it's the shelter, and it's, it's part of the clean water systems. Big fan of plants. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jules. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on where I'm speaking with you today, the Gubby Gubby people, and um, pay respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And I, hello to everyone. It's kind of a bit um, weird for us here because we're talking to each other as a group of five, and I know there's other people out there. So hi and <laughs> welcome to the session. <laughs> um, thanks, Chels. Uh, you, you know, whenever I hear you speak, I feel like an absolute infant because I'm, I'm a first generation born Australian. Um, my mum came here when she was young. Um, on my dad's side, I'm a second generation. And so my knowledge and connection to this, to this land and to the systems is so new. And I feel like I'm, you know, only just beginning to sort of touch on the beginnings of this deep thread of, of knowledge. We were just talking before we opened up the session today. Uh, Charles, I think you were saying 120,000 years of continuous uh, cultural emergence of 
uh, here in Australia. Enormous, you know, beyond our even capacity to, to understand the depth of that. And so as a, as a permaculture practitioner, one of the things that we focus on is that, and I feel that it, it connects really well with what you're saying, because the basis of permaculture is earth care. That's, that's everything about what we do. Earth care, people care, fair share, but earth care is, is the foundation of it. And, and actually quite often people think that permaculture is an approach that is about growing food and that's the foundation. Actually, the key part of permaculture is trying to find ways to, to meet our needs within the system with as least space and as least impact as possible so that there's far more space for rewilding, regeneration of landscapes and, that, and how we actually design and integrate our own human presence in the landscape is a regenerative one too. And I was just spending a bit of time um, wandering up through our valley um, today, just behind my place and, and reflecting on, on this sense of connection. I've only been here for 20 years within Crystal Waters. And even in that time, though, something about our way to slow down, observe, connect deeply in place starts to give us a sense of these relationships and how they form and how it might feel to actually have such a deep connection to place. And it's something about that, the proximity, the slowing down, the being connected um, to, to land, to community and to the species around. You know, for example, you know, I kind of feel like here within this eco village, uh, the people are just one of the dwellers in the landscape. And, uh, you know, for example, the way in which uh, it's been designed means that uh, there's no fences between people's places. So the kangaroos, the kangaroo pathways continue. And I was actually following a kangaroo path today as I wandered my way up to the, up to the ridge through these regenerating forests. <laughs> And I met up with a couple of kangaroos who were pelting their way down the hill and they kind of like sliding off down the hill. I always got completely bowled over, but I follow the kangaroo pathways and I made some big mistakes when I was early on. I was trying to do the right thing by regenerating the landscape, doing a lot of, um, you know, tree planting of, of local indigenous species. And I just completely put them in the wrong spot. I put them in a place where it was actually a kangaroo pathway. And, you know, 90% of them got completely trounced and so I had to start to rethink how I was being in this place and how that being just one of the dwellers in the landscape that the way in which I planted the way in which I was trying to do the regeneration had to be in a, in in sort of in cooperation with with all the species that are here and really start to recognize that kind of the well-being of the land and the ecosystems and uh, and other species is really completely intertwined with our own. And so, you know, looking after the whole. Um, so um, some of the things, you know, that I've started to notice, uh, you know, for example, today, um, it was about 10.30, and there was this great cacophony of kookaburra sounds just absolutely going off. And so what I've learnt through the stories of this place is that, if you hear that, it's not just one kookaburra or two kookaburras. It's like a whole flock of kookaburras just making that sound that it's going to rain soon. And uh, so I kind of, I, you know, I always second guess myself. So I did a bit of a check on the weather search and lo and behold, you know, showers are, are due in the next hour. <clears throat> and, and then there's also the rain birds that come through. And, and because I'm really the way that I've tried to design the edible landscape in and around here is to not be just setting up an irrigation system. And, a, you know, it's not like Mr. McGregor's garden. It's this food forest. And that it's really trying to be based on the type of natural rainfall patterns and, the, you know, working with the, the cycles that are here and learning those. Um, and so I've become really quite aware that the signals for the rain coming give me a great sense of a joy and, and relief. And there's certain smells that you start to, to notice. And when you start to slow down and connect with, with the land, like I'm saying this is a complete newbie because, you know, like I said, it's a, I've been 
our family's been in, on this country for 70 years. But I'm starting to notice things that make me feel that if we create a lifestyle that gives us a chance to slow down enough to notice and to be actually reliant on, on our landscape around us for food, for building materials, for water, uh, and that noticing how much the care of the land is also intertwined with the care of, of community and care of the regeneration of the whole system. We do things very differently. You know, I think I might have mentioned last time, even just that idea that when we relocalize the way in which we live, like every piece of water that comes out of our house goes back into the landscape. So what we do with that water in the meantime, we take care of it. We, you know, that care is embedded in the, the way in which we, we live because the direct impact is there. So this coming closer to home, coming close to the impact, understanding, you know, the, the direct relationship between the food system around us and our lives and the lives of the, the wildlife and other species is, is, it changes the way in which you live. And I think that kind of comes a little bit towards finding ways to, to as you're saying, re-indigenize. Um, because, I, you know, I don't feel a sense of connection to where I come from, my family. And, but I do feel a deep sense of joy and deep sense of connection where I am now. And so trying to find my way into that place and ask as many questions and be open to know that I'm an absolute infant in this space, that every day I learn something new and I try and walk as many times through the landscape with, with local elders to, to um, share the knowledge of the place and to share the stories of, of what to harvest. And one of the things that I really loved last time I went walking about was to say, you know, look at the plant. You don't just harvest whatever you feel like. You actually look and to, you know, ha ask the plant, you know, which bit can I harvest? Which bit uh, is going to be something that is going to be useful for, for me and, but also not harming the plant? And so there's a the relationship. And I, I think this bringing together the people, nature and, and food systems together in this kind of permaculture eco-village way is possibly one of the most sound regenerative approaches to living lightly on the planet so that we have a chance to regenerate and it feels it feels great like I feel a sense of joy every time I enter into the landscape but I also feel a sense of pain when something goes wrong and I think there's something in that that it hurts when you notice something going wrong for example the other place that I have a deep connection with is the Gippsland Lakes and and my family's has this uh a long history there too and I've noticed like I'm 51 so I've been going there for my entire life and I've noticed over the years how there's this shifting and changing in the lakes from seaweed to ocean ocean weed from the jellyfish type are changing the fish have diminished the black swans have gone the the um the koalas uh, um habitat is disappearing and this this change that's happening over time that it feel you feel so much pain as a result of that and knowing that it's directly related to an economic decision about opening up the channel into the lake so that the fish fishery boats can get in and out far more easily and, and harvest more fish completely um economic decision and the ripple effects of that so um just coming back to that point, I think, and I'll finish there, is, is just about slowing down enough to feel like a human scale, a, an ecological scale way of life that gives us a chance to deeply connect and, and see and know and, and see the connections that are around us and to, you know, the thing that I love, one of the most things that I love about this place is watching the birth of clouds. And I don't know if that's a name of this place, but I watch every day as clouds kind of get born off the hills just below here. Like I watch them just come up in the morning, they just go, Poof, and then they just kind of float up. You can see the shape of them. And every day, I, and there must be a name for that. I'm sure it's not, you know, Conondale. But 
there's a name and I would love to know what it is. <laughs> yeah. So um, that sense of being having an earth centric life and feeling that the well-being of of us is deeply connected with the well-being of the ecosystems and designing our way of life to meet that. And that's kind of where the permaculture design, regenerative design and being you know, fully informed by indigenous cultures and traditional practices, I think is, is, you know, I've been living this for, for as long as I can remember. And it feels, it feels right. And I don't know how else to explain it. And I, and I would love to invite as many people to, you know, to come and explore, come and visit and, and see what it's maybe something different. Maybe it's something in between. I'm not sure who'd like to pick up from that. <laughs> I have a, I have a question for you, Charles, because I, I sense that you've, you carry an experience of building a bridge that is now such an important bridge to build, but probably also an experience of all the tra trauma and dysfunctionality of um, one of the cultures that are trying to meet here. And I'm speaking to bridging into, as a, as a systems ecologist, bridging into the world of science and, and data analysis and understanding within Western scientific frameworks, um, ecosystems dynamics. And, and then, okay, now people say we need to pay more attention to indigenous knowledge. But I'm, I, my sense is, and I want to check that with you, that too often you're brought in as the token indigenous ecology exists in the room and then you might not even be given the place to speak first although your people have been there for so long and um, how do we truly bring together in a sense of both valuing contributions from both sides in a way that because I, right now there's also this tendency to to shut up everybody white completely forever because they've just messed it up and 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 there's this sense of where well, you should you should just be in the outer circle and listen for a very long time um where do you where do you sit with with that because you also in 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 your opening remarks you were saying um we need to find like um finding a new future by design. And then you said this will force us to use new sciences and new technologies. And I just wanted to check with you, when you use the word technology there, is it in the sense of technology that most westernized listeners would, um, would understand it? Or do you refer to all the, the things that you were also speaking about as technologies of the sacred that your people have been um, developing over 40,000 years, which are possibly more powerful to live healthily in place than any kind of um, SpaceX rocket taking another satellite out into space. Um, so just giving, passing the ball back to you to tell us a little bit more about those nuances of making these worlds meet. Yeah, I think um, because of past practices, um, you know, in, in Australia especially, what you essentially had was you know, another country with their own social constructs and ideologies, you know, essentially forcing their way into, you know, Indigenous people's country and dressing it up as being terra nullius, no one's home, lights are out, nothing going on here, um, a backwards and, you know, dumb people that have, you know, no intelligence, etc. That's what was, Australia was dressed up and sold to Britain as and, you know, it was essentially all part, part of that construct of, you know, taking over um, someone's uh, country. And, you know, it still happens today. Um, it's just part of that, that overall strategy. But, you know, I think we're, we're at a point where, you know, the, there is realisation now that, you know, it wasn't like that at all. You know, the technologies that existed in Australia, um, you know, we had people within, you know, Aboriginal clans that were that were doctors, you know, they were medicine people. We had people in there that were scientists, people that, you know, were alchemists and, and mixed potions together from plants and, and you know, remedies to, to make, you know, medicines or, you know, poisons and, 
etc. Yeah, you you had you know, your chemists in there that were able to extract you know, highly toxic chemicals out of seeds and plant species to make them edible. Um, you, you know, you, you, you had farmers in there, you had people that, you know, farmed extensive parts of country, whether it was through fire stick farming or whether it was direct farming, you know, yams and yam farms are a perfect example of that. You know, your, your kangaroo grasses and your, 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 you know, your eel farms in, in, in Victoria, you know, those sort of technologies were existing in Australia prior to, you know, any colonisation. And those systems all, and those technologies all revolved around this, this eco or earth centric um, um, cultural construct that, that put, you know, the environment and those, those um, biological, ecological and natural systems, you know, first as the primacy in how you then generate your law, your customs, your beliefs, your your technologies, um, you know, your your living arrangements, your social construct, intermarriage, and how many you know, which resource capability and land capability, um, you know, resource partitioning, and then it just you know just spirals on and on from there, um, you know, and in Australia, you know, the, over the last two centuries, you know, the the, the value and the application of yeah, Aboriginal ecological knowledge has been accepted and you know, some of it's been also fused into Western lifestyles you know, without too much controversy. You know? So one of the issues is when that holisticness of Aboriginal knowledge uh, is deconstructed and it's not taken as a holistic component. So for instance, you know, um, things like uh, medicines you know, have been isolated into to separate knowledge. You know, and, and that medicinal component of native plants. You know, we've got antiseptics from eucalyptus, tea tree, lemon myrtle, uh, you know, the manuka honeys or the honeys that are in um, calistamin um, species. Um, you know, or in the, in the case of, you know, what's starting to happen now is the application of fire in the landscape for ecosystem management and species management. And to then also reduce some of those um, fears and risks with high fuel loads. Um, and, you know, people are now starting to understand and recognise, you know, cultural burning practices in managing those, those landscape dynamics. Um, but one component is what I'm saying is that you know there still tends to be a a culture of de deconstructing, and so taking out those bits and pieces that we as you know uh, Western white folk think are are more applicable and usable and of value to us. So what you're essentially doing is deconstructing that whole cultural system and that whole you know, paradigm of, of everything holisticness and you know a, a future by design or a new future basically needs to have you know all those things as integrated components into it so that includes you know looking at the spirituality starting to see the landscape and the rivers and the mountains as living entities which we're now starting to see where people are now dedicating rivers and mountains and their whole shires as you know live, living entities with the same rights as as people. So that's it's it's all that component you know taking up the knowledge you know the as I said earlier that knowledge one of the things that I see that you know, could be integrated into Australia and you know, there was a question that came up as you know well how do we start bridging within a multicultural society. And you know, bringing you know the, the whole culturally diverse population in. One of those, as I mentioned, is the use of you know seasonal um, calendars and, and acknowledging traditional seasonal cycles. We don't have four seasons in Australia. If you've been in Australia for longer than ten years, or even five, or even twenty, you'd understand that there's not four seasons in Australia. 
you know, we've got at least, you know, six to seven, and that's in line with traditional seasonal cycles. And it's though that acknowledgement and understanding those, those seasonal cycles that then helps us to understand the plants, the animals, you know, going surfing or going swimming during shark time or shark season, you know, you, you can avoid those sort of disasters, you know, then it relates to fire management as well. Um, you know, eating fish species that are in season and not being shipped and exported and imported from other places. So you, you know, with what Morag was saying, you, you're eating more at that bioregional level and to seasonal, you know, seasonal consumption basically. And then, you know, you're looking at this resilience and adaptation. If you understand you know, our seasonal changes and our seasonal cycles, um, you know, it, it helps you become to become a bit more resilient. So you, you know that there's going to be a period, you know, after December that's really intensely hot and, and, and humid, but then it's that that brings on that monsoonal event and those monsoonal pressure systems from out of the coral sea and out of you know that that area um and they influence then our weather patterns in australia so you know that then helps us to go okay well you know we only have to put up with this for what you know three weeks and then we get intense downpour and then you know the little periods in between um you know spring and summer which is dry and, you know, and where animals are just starting to, you know, uh, rejuvenate and, and seeds and everything is starting to fall. So, you know, and primarily, you know, species diversity is starting to flourish and function and your insects are, you know, in there doing what they do. You know, it's definitely a time to just let those cycles do their thing. Um, and then, you know, understanding that it's these sort of things that help us become, you know, adaptable and, and resilient in the future. Because once we're getting tuned to the fact that we don't have four seasons, that we have six to seven, you know, it helps us to understand climate change and changes in these, you know, regional, national and, and localised weather systems and weather patterns. So that's one thing that, you know, we can start looking at um, in bridging and, and bringing those worlds together and understanding a bit more. And, yeah, there's a whole suite, but, you know, as I said, it involves taking on that holisticness of everything and not just picking apart and pulling out what you want to. And that's probably one of the biggest things, Daniel, that, um, you know, as an ecologist that I deal with and, you know, I was saying earlier that, you know, even looking at you know separating Aboriginal culture from things like biodiversity. Agenda. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll give an introduction to Jason. Um, <laughs> Jason's um, yeah. When I was writing my PhD, yeah, I got into a really depressive mode. I was at a point where it was like, yeah, <laughs> everything's yeah you know, stuffed and yeah, you know, what's the use of it? And yeah, you know, capitalism and yeah, you know, these multinationals are going to rule the world and dictate how we live into the next ten, twenty years. Um, and then I met Jason, and Jason opened up my eyes um, to this whole. Um, system of urban design and, and regenerative urban design. And I started working with Jason and where it's another area where we started to look at um, uh, laying indigenous um, fundamentals and those paradigms as a base uh, foundation to then building um, urban scapes. So I'll, I'm not sure whether that's what you're going to talk about, but Oh, that, that was the <laughs> intro that I gave you. <laughs> I'll talk about that next week. But, okay. Uh, oh, stay tuned to it because it'll be cool. Yeah. So I'm acknowledging uh, I'm calling in from Gadigal land and recognizing their elders past and present, the Ura Nation, um, and then the Bugga Bugga people on Gambanger Nation um, who have kind of uh, adopted me, Chels. And I have a huge bit of gratitude to Charles because um, she's given me the best gift of my life of uh, the friendship, family, love, of opening up her heart and home to me. And, 
and sharing the knowledge she's sharing with you tonight, um, which has been pretty prolific. And I'll, and I'll give a little bit of insight about my journey as a non-indigenous person and, you know, why I gravitated towards chills and how we started working together. But, you know, from the East Coast in the U.S. And I, I was born on colonized land. I was raised in a colonized Western education system. You know, we were taught, you know, cowboys and Indians. It's something in the past. Um, very little of anything about contemporary First Peoples in the Americas. Um, a little blurb here and there in museums we'd visit. Um, and it wasn't until in New York, I was on East 8th Street in the village, and I'll share this maybe about next week as well, and I saw that, you know, that t-shirt of Chief Seattle and that phrase, you know, we don't belong to the earth, the earth, we, sorry, we belong to the earth, the earth does not belong to us. And that just simple phrase that we belong to the earth created a little crack in my mind. And I was probably 14 or 15 at the time. And, you know, my life journey has been about continuing to crack my mind and decolonize my mind or cultivate, cultivate a new way of thinking. Um, in New York, it was really hard to get that connection. Um, what I learned about First Peoples is they, you know, that they have a stereotype of not being afraid of heights. So a lot of them were the steel workers in New York City that were not afraid to be up on 50, 60 stories up in the air on a beam of steel. Um, little else was learned in that regard from my perspective. And, and when I moved to Seattle, it was a bit more. There was naming, place naming. There was different acknowledgement to First Peoples there. Nothing like I, I've learned an acknowledging country here in Australia. Um, worked with some different um, tribes in the Northwest, um, much more connected. Um, and then I came across this work that was happening in Santa Fe, at the Santa Fe Institute on the language of spirituality. And it was basically a gathering of indigenous elders with Western scientists and linguistics and looking at reconciling the kind of scientific Western analytical way of explaining the world and the storytelling and lore that you heard at Charles open up with today. And, and, and the customs and traditions and ontology and epistemology friction between the two, that wasn't letting the scientists understand, you know, how the Western scientists had wronged them in the even in the conversations that were happening. And there's a really good paper on that by a woman named Zimmerman. It really helped, really, it cracked my mind open quite a bit about the source of where my knowledge came from, the traditions I grew up in in my family, you know, the values that were instilled in me. You know, unlike what I've learned from my Mallory brothers and sisters when they're born, the placenta is buried in the earth where they're from, having that country-centered, you know, anchor in them. I've never felt home. I've never, I've moved like 15 times in my life. So I've just had to kind of cultivate my own mind that the earth is my home wherever I am. And the people around me are my family. Um, then when I came to Australia, it was the first time I started hearing people acknowledge country. And I was like, oh, that's great. Um, and then my wife knows how much I, I chase this knowledge and read books about it, study it, and to help me reprogram my mind and my way of seeing the world. And I went and saw Charles give a lecture at the Australian Museum because I saw, my wife sent me this link, she's like, oh, you'll love this, this is right up your alley. And, and I, even before the lecture, I emailed Charles and introduced myself, like, I'm coming to see you, I want to meet you. <laughs> like I was stalked, he calls me her stalker. Um, but, you know, she, what she said resonated with me into my core, right? And I could say in the four years I've been working with Chels, I've learned more than I have in the previous 25 years I've been studying this topic. Um, completely, uh, sorry, I cried. <laughs> it's such a huge gift. Um, and I take it with so much respect um, that I, you know, custodian of this knowledge. And what I'm, my responsibility is, how I, I carry that forward to my kids. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a very sensitive dude. Um, and how important it is that, that this knowledge really shape Western society. And there's a question in there, how do you reconcile this knowledge? And it's not just leaning on First Peoples and just, and, and just continuing to ask questions is one thing that Charles is really gracious at the time, but like, it's like a 12 step program. You have to every day reprogram your mind the morning you wake up. And so I always have to reprogram my mind, put my feet on the ground, and I say, you know, I belong to the earth and I'm in service to life. And that's that, just that quick statement centers me every morning about what, who I am, what, what, you know, what I'm doing with my life, how I interact with people around me. 
Um, but it's I've had to spend a lot of time with other non-Indigenous people learning, reading a book called Decolonizing Solidarity, understanding how a lot of non-Indigenous people come into this, this place and want to provide a service or support this movement um, and have set it back because they didn't understand how to operate within that world. Um, so we've had to teach ourselves in work groups, you know, how, am I more, how can I be more in service to indigenous causes in Australia, where I'm from? Um, how do I open doors? How do I make sure that we're acknowledging deeper, we're going more authentically in that space? And the work we do, um, I mean, a lot of it's just opening up a door and putting, you know, get Chels in the room and Chels does what she does. And we're sitting around a room of developers, builders, architects, engineers, and you can see the magic of how their entire mental model around starting a project completely shifts. And they approach it from a very different perspective and how they look at the land, how they look at culture, how they look at the, the deep history of that place and how to respect that before they put a pencil to paper. And that's been a huge shift in some of the work we've been doing in Australia. And it's, I mean, there's also another really huge dimension to this, I think, is language. Um, and I know my sister Lucy's on the phone, and she's also been an incredible mentor to me um, and really teaching me Maori you know, ideology and spirituality. Um, but, you know, there's, there's so many different language groups within Australia. As one in New Zealand, I see that's a really powerful mechanism shifting Western minds and understanding that words and language have very different meaning. And a mountain means five different things in relationality totemically to those rivers, to that mountain, to that, to that sky, is imbued in that language. And we're raised in a language that separates us from that. Um, I think it was Bill Reed who gave me the book, Tending the Wild, and it was the first time I really understood the nature wasn't really in the lexicon of First Nations Americans. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, you know, to be separate from is something completely outside of that mindset. Um, but it's a daily reprieve of really changing and reprogramming your mind. Um, and it's not easy. I think we just had a session with Tyson Yakapura last week and he, you know, I told him about my 12 step life I'm 20 years sober. And there's a lot of correlation between when you, when you pivot your life and change your direction where you're going to go. And it's a daily mental model shift around that. And he created the Anthro Anthroholics Anonymous 12-step program for <laughs> re-indigenating your mind. Um, and it is like that. You know, it's, yes, you can read a bunch of books. Yes, you can go to lectures, but it's a daily practice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm really grateful that my children have, have grown up with Chels around them and Chels' daughter, Lacey, and, and her brother, and going up on her ancestral home in Balanola to really walk in the woods and learn the plants, learn the species, what are the medicinal plants, something I never had as a kid, right? And like, how do we get that knowledge into our schools? What's my responsibility knowing that knowledge that when I go to my kid's school and they're offering Spanish, Italian, French, and Chinese, like why aren't you teaching them Gadigal? That's a language that's still living right here on the, on the land that they're, they're learning on. Why aren't you teaching that? And they're not. So it's a lot of, you know, the responsibility we have with this knowledge is really important and how do we engage and the, the conversation I had with David McConville this morning, some of you guys might know, he's a brilliant thinker. And we basically come to the conclusion that we're not going to solve any of these issues ecologically or socially until we decolonize the world. And it starts with decolonizing our minds. Um, and that's, a, that's an individual responsibility that we take on ourselves to do. Um, with the gift of knowing that First Nations living culture all around the world is a living body of knowledge that has a lot of solutions. Mm -hmm to driving this pathway to planetary health and saving humanity from itself. I'll stop there. I just wanted to briefly come in on this, this notion of, of um, re-indigenization because it's one of those words that when you use it as a Western white, over-educated, over-privileged guy, you're almost certainly gonna get a bunch of backlash from people who then start lecturing on whatever project it, takes place in that moment but you you chose gels you chose that um as as part of you the title for for this session and and i would love to hear your perspective on what is a process of re-indigenization and as disconnected culturally colonized 
like all our minds have been colonized um, by the story of neoliberal economics and so on and so forth. Um, do we white people have the possibility of redemption in in the process of of reindigenization? And is it like because from my perspective, we're all like if we begin to learn the wisdom that you shared at the beginning, that we too are the children and in the lineage of ancestors that, that are sky father and the, the sea and the, uh, the ocean and, um, and every living being has the, the mountains, the rivers, are our ancestors too. Um, the, the, the question is how do we live in right relationship to these ancestors again in place with deep connection to the story of place and whatever is still there of the ancestral history that some people have guarded. Um, how do you how do you see this process of reindigenization? And and is are there any um, invitations in terms of how to be a humble apprentice and pilgrim on that path to? people who do care to make that bridge, even if they might maybe on the side of the perpetrators um, historically. Side of perpetrators, I like that. Look, that's that's a big, long question. I think you had about 20 questions within one question, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I, I think um, one of the key components is, is obviously, um, yeah, that acknowledgement. Um, and one of the components of that is, I think, what we're all getting wrapped up, up in is that, you know, everywhere on every continent, you know, Western society is still colonising. Yeah, and it's just like, okay, how about we stop the colonising and accept that we've colonised or, you know, these places have been colonised to their max capacity are you guys getting that buzz yeah um all right can you guys hear me yes yeah get, i'm just getting a buzz um i got struck by lightning once and it just comes back on me i just don't know when it's going to happen um <laughs> And it's 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 that approach that and that ideology of just you know let's just keep colonising and colonising. Hey, let's form formulate some plants to start colonising Mars while we're colonising Earth. And it's like, okay, well, how about we just you know, <laughs> stop the colonising? Yeah, you know? we've colonised to our max capacity. Let's start looking at you know where we start. You know now designing how we live in harmony, and part of that is seeing yourself as part of these ecological, biological, astronomical cycles, that you are part of it. You're not separated from it. You know, we, are, we are a living entity. We are a living system within these living cycles. You know, what's my place? Do I put myself in this human-centric position as being above and beyond all of it? And then I just treat it, you know, as I wish, with no respect and no, you know, thought to the future and the ramification of my actions? Or do I see myself as an integral part of these biological and ecological systems that are happening around me? Because they essentially are the things that will make me who I am while I'm in this place in this landscape. They will dictate my moods. They will dictate where I go. They will dictate the food that I eat. So the first thing is respecting and acknowledging that. And, you know, that's one of the key components of an indigenized paradigm. It might be, I see a question about incorporating this stuff into our work, maybe more practically how we're looking at indigenous urbanism on some projects. Um, I'll use, we'll use one of the example projects we've worked on, Shells, where it starts with that cultural assessment ecological assessment of place right? and, and and shell is very graciously making connection with um the local custodians wherever we're working so they they have a voice and a say in what happens and how it's shaped and that's usually a dialogue we have between the developer and them 
it, first is open, cracking open the mindset of the developer group mm. so that they understand this stuff. And that's kind of a tag team effort to kind of really frame it. Um, the design team usually is ambitious and wants to jump in. Um, and you know, bringing the kind of regenerative indigenous model into that dialogue, it gives them a nice framework to work within. And a really powerful tool, which y'all talked about, is that ecological calendar. Right, knowing that we've mapped out these species that are, are, are known to be from this land that we're looking at redeveloping or creating something from. Um, these are the main thriving things. These are ones that are threatened. So there's going to be a responsibility in the infrastructure we put in and the, the, whatever we put in housing or buildings that respect that and, and regenerate that, that species or flora or fauna. Um, so it gives, it, it gives basically a, a framework for the design team to work within that respects what's working for life in that, that land is the first question we asked. But importantly then, how it interprets into the architecture, the vernacular of architecture that tells the story of that land and creates that uniqueness of place that's missing from our industry completely. I walk around any city, anywhere in the world, and I can't really tell where I am. If you take away the Opera House and the, the Harbor Bridge, the same skyline everywhere else. So we're missing that. And that's what's, what frustrates me about Australia, you have like 120,000 years of knowledge and stories and expression of culture and place to draw from to express that architecture, which I don't see. And it's tokenistic and it comes through in arts here and there. It's a 1% you know, of the budget here. But there's such a powerful medium to draw from to shape that architectural vernacular that makes this place so distinctive and makes the world want to see it. And it tells the story of what the values of this country are about and recognizing that culture. But importantly, the most important, I think, is the governance. All right, so how do you instill that totemic relationship into a new community? How do you get the, the, those living systems of flora and fauna into the school and teach the children that they have a responsibility and a connection to the, what is it, Latham Snipe or the yeah. Golden Sun Moth? Golden Sun Moth, yeah. Sun Moth is a good one. Um, and how does that, you know, how, what place naming, right? How, I mean, we talked about the setting in a previous session. How do you get people to call their home associated with their watershed? We talked about that with bioregionalism. Like, like what watershed are you from? Like, you know, how do you connect people to the living system that they're sitting within? Because we, we disassociate ourselves with it so much. We name our streets after colonists, you know, like we acknowledge white heroes from the past. Um, it's very different in New Zealand. Um, it still has a long way to go, but it's, it's, it's more progressed in that manner. Um, but that governance piece is huge. How do you inculcate this in the culture of a place? And all that stuff I've talked about before creates that foundation for that culture to arise from that place. But then how it's governed, how people communicate, how people understand they have a responsibility of custodianship to what's around them. And it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long human story ahead of us, but like this is the journey and path that we have to go on. And how it changes our, the way we teach our children in the home and in the school is a huge one we talked about last time. You wanna to add to that, Charles? Um, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay. Just, um, it, it was an interesting process and, and, and this was the, the, the sort of stuff that came um, at the end of my, of my research and study. And it was like, yeah, it, it was such an eye opener. Um, it was like, yeah, look, we, this sort of um, technology, Daniel, um, can be used, um, you know, in also urban design and, and, and uh, regenerative restructure of, um, you know, demised or destroyed places as part of, you know, that whole um, uh, reconstruction. Um, and then starting with a new slate, you know, applying some of these ideologies of, you know, place meaning, um, you know, I showed Jason a, a map of uh, Gumbangi country and, you know, <laughs> there's no roads on it. There's no, you know, <laughs> no nothing, like no lines or no boundaries that, you know, it's it's a Gumbangia landscape, and every um, town or every um, primary location has its traditional meaning and its traditional component. And these names, if you imagine over you know, 120, 80,000 years, um, 
that 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 knowledge of you know meaning of place um you know it, it's got substance to it you know so in one place we have you know the the place of rocks um and yeah you know it's a rocky place the 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 place of you know the dolphins and that's where the dolphins sort of rest and you know um the the resting side of you know the the golden kangaroo where the kangaroo lays and you know so all these names you know were given to the landscape um because there was it was knowledge about the landscape and as jason said you know part of this this continual colonizing is you know taking away the essence of, of that area and of that place and renaming it with something that means absolutely nothing and has no meaning to it whatsoever so you know um I, I saw a question come up about you know how can we integrate these these into you know our current systems and our future design you know that's another way um of doing it giving that recognition back to place and 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 giving that knowledge that's attached to it you know back to country and 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 you know including the people that hold that knowledge and a part of that dna within that landscape a platform and a place to participate and a place to you know be part of the conversation and to be part of sculpting you know that new future and you know that new social construct and you know being part of you know contributing to you know the solutions to our problems and the direction you know of of our our systems and our landscape Shells, we're unfortunately we're sliding out of time. We could. This is such a rich, rich conversation. It could go on for another hour. Um, could you have a look at the questions in the Q and A and yep. see whether there's any you can pick up and respond to in the last ten minutes or so? Yeah. Look, I'll start with the bottom one. Uh, look, um, my PhD is being ed edited at the moment. Um, into a, a book um so hopefully that will be out um fairly soon it, when i can apply the time i'll do i'll do the edits required um but there's also a few papers that have come out of my phd um and one of them uh will be available or online fairly soon and i think it's in the form of a of a of a book as well the second chapter and that's i think that's being published in switzerland um so there's lots of, and then the next question is, what's the paper about the scientific? There's there's lots of um, papers out at the moment. You know, in the last 20, 20 years, when traditional ecological knowledge and indigenous knowledge systems, you know, started to be recognised and come to the forefront, um, you know, there's 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 lots of uh, papers um, out there now, and a lot more indigenous. Um, people writing these papers um which is really good so it's coming from first-hand experience and it's you know part of that decolonizing methodology of you know giving that direct information um and then there's another one here about um how do we integrate the settlers i think we've sort of covered some of that with some of the areas and we don't have time tonight to go fully into the full suite um, but over the next series, I'm sure we will. Um, and then there's one here that said to, hey, are you, hi Charles from Matt, um, are you seeing any of the living rivers or mountains being recognised anywhere in Australia? Um, as a matter of fact, um, Jason, you might have to help me out on this one. So my, my mind's starting to go a bit mush. Um, I believe the Blue Mountains, um, I don't think that's a secret, is it? I thought I thought that was in like a newspaper article. Yeah. You guys got you guys can't hear me, can you? No, we can hear you fine. I, oh, I, okay. I had to move the dialogue boxes out of the way. I was trying to. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, there's a couple of hot zones across the country. So there is a group that we started. Um, that's part of the Commonwealth Initiative that Daniel's um, part of with me uh, around basically regenerating the planet, you know, reversing global warming through the Commonwealth Nations. Um, and importantly, the group is 98% women and being led by Indigenous leaders like Chels. 
um, as it should be. And there's there's a couple of there's a place in the Kimberleys that Dr. Anna Polina is working on. So Ken introduced me to Anne. Thank you, Ken. Um, Morag's got stuff in Queens. There's, there's some really incredible hot zones that are Aboriginal communities in Queensland, Victoria, WA, um, New South Wales. Blue Mountains is one hot zone because it's it's a really important area of the country, but also the council there is really it's a more government led. Um, and our colleague Louise Crabtree is working with Mich Michelle Maloney and Chills um, on a pretty powerful platform there. But that's you got to go where the energy is right now. I think the bushfires created, you know, a, a, say a national crack, you know, an opening. COVID nineteen allowed that crack to digest in our minds over the last three months. Um, and I think uh, there's a strong impetus that we rebound out of this situation in a different direction, and it's making sure that we're making these connections and recognizing the role that indigenous leaders like Charles and that knowledge that they have in place and country can, can start to shape the direction of a community and the direction of a bioregion. Um, so there's, there's, some, there's some great work to happen um, over the next several months. I can see it. It's, it. There's huge potential happening, which is great. It's hopeful. Yeah, look, it's 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 happening in many realms. It's also happening in the marine science realm as well. And you know, the um bio marine science realm. Um it, it's 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 starting to slowly, you know, infiltrate into a lot of um government systems as well. We're still you know, we've still got a long way to go, but you know, those 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 cracks in the filtering is starting to happen and it's it's unfortunate that you know it takes immense natural disasters and the death of you know people and animals and life for people to start to understand that there there is another way there is another knowledge system there are other tools to that we can use in our toolbox for sustainability um, and yeah I'm just hoping that you know in in the future you know, as we start to rebuild um, and that we start to realise, you know, that we, we, we're hopeless and we're useless without, you know, those, those eco, ecological um, functions that, that we're part of and that operate around us and, and, and with us. And if we keep separating ourselves from those systems, um, you know, we're basically setting ourselves up, you know, for dire consequences. And we're already seeing, you know, ramifications of that sort of ideology now. And, you know, if we can draw upon Indigenous peoples, you know, knowledge and, you know, systems um, to help us understand and, and to you know, function and adapt in that, you know, well, what's wrong with that? What's, what's the problem with that, really? Can I ask a very practical question, Charles? So you've spent a lot of time exploring and documenting those, um, those seasonal calendars in your area. So, for example, if someone's from another part of Australia, um, how, how do they connect up with those so say for example i'm thinking you know people are really looking at you know regenerating their agricultural systems and rethinking the whole like where do they begin to do this how can they connect good question it i think it depends on where you are and you know what what that um landscape and environment's like and you know a good place to start is obviously to scope out and source out, you know, local knowledge holders and, and, and you know, um, maybe if there's any sort of um, universities or anything that has a, a, a cultural uh, education unit attached to it, Aboriginal language centres, um, you know, there's lots of these organisations that, you know, ha have knowledge or can facilitate, you know, and, and point in the right direction. Um, you know, and, and the, I think the, the most important thing is, is, is coming in sort of 
you know, knowing that you, know, you might not get the answer in some places and you know, Aboriginal people are still, you know, still very you know, <laughs> aware and, um, what is it, alert but not alarmed <laughs> about, um, you know, people coming in and, and wanting to sort of, you know, have knowledge, and et cetera. But I think, you know, we're at that point in time where if we don't start, um, you know, moving in this direction of a, of a, a future by design that incorporates Aboriginal people and our knowledge and our systems and us for a start, um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be, you know, this, this big white car driving off the cliff. <laughs> very, very, just one brief thing to tie a beautiful loop to this wonderful conversation that I learned so much in. Um, you started off by, by saying that you people's totem is the ocean. And I, I sense that one of the big connectors of us, of, of life, mm -hmm. is that we're walking water and um, that we deeply depend on oceans, particularly in the face of climate change. I think we're not paying, we're paying too much attention to the carbon counting, my carbon myopia, and not enough attention to how critical the ocean ecosystems um, are to regulating mm. all those larger yes. cycles that people are aware of. Can, can you speak a little bit to the importance of the oceans to sort of tie this all beautifully together? All right, and, and, and I'll, Ken, I'll, we'll wrap it up in, in this, but um, you're absolutely correct, Daniel, and, you know, it's, it's surprising that, you know, a lot of people still think that, yeah, all our oxygen comes out of the Amazon rainforest and from trees. Um, you know, not many people are um, familiar with the, you know, oxygen-carbon exchange that happens within the ocean and how important those ocean systems are for all of our climate um, and all the weather patterns throughout the whole globe. And it's essentially that one medium that joins all of us together. It's the one thing that connects us all. And, you know, we, we have, you know, our oceans suffering as well. Um, you know, we've got species that are being lost we've got you know some of the ecological cycles starting to get out of whack and you know they're, they're key indicators that something's wrong you know key indicators and you know that appreciation of this this organ this living organ you know i call it like you know the the the, the heart the lung and the soul um, that keeps this planet alive. It's the one thing that's conducive to all life on this planet. And, you know, it does deserve a place and recognition that it's part of that. It's, it, it's that one systems function that is going to, you know, affect how we live into the future. Can we uh, close with a call to action? I'll, I'll give you the UN stuff, but we also did a lot of engagement with, well, if you're in Australia, you know, some of the things that kind of guide industry, like Green Star, right, that a lot of decision making, decision making is from. We were engaged by the Bring Your Building Council, and what started as an innovation credit on how you, you know, how do you look at indigenous knowledge on architecture and, and planning your communities. And we wrote it, all the things we're talking about on this call, um, but, you know, we also said it shouldn't be an innovation credit, it should be a prerequisite. And in fact, the whole Green Star system should be rethought to be aligned with the UN Declaration for Rights of Indigenous People. So we, we are a signatory of that declaration. And I learned that from Chels. So that's something that, you know, as advocates, all of us have a responsibility to support. Mm -hmm. a, lot of this, a lot of what we're talking about is sacred land. That means something very different to you, that, that most of us don't see that, but to the local people from that place, it's sacred land. And every time, Ken, you're posting it every week, I see you posting like they're opening up a mine on someone's sacred land. They're destroying the, you know, the reef system that's sacred, you know, ocean area. Like that's a really important issue that doesn't get framed in that, that UN declaration lens enough in this country. Yeah. Well, that's a, a very good point to finish on, I think, Jason. And uh, we've just had the appalling, the appalling uh, demonstration of 
uh, Rio Tinto blowing up a, a very uh, significant sacred site in the, Pil uh, in the Pilgra. And it's, 40 th it's a, a, a site that's 46,000 years old. It contains evidence of habitation during the life, the, the Ice Age, and it just got in the way of the expansion of a mine. So Rio Tinto just blew it up. And what, what uh, uh, appalls me about this is that this is not only a, uh, uh, the most extraordinary disregard of ind indigenous rights and indigenous culture, it's an offence against the whole of humanity. These sites are the heritage of all human beings. It, it's like uh, a, a mining company saying, uh, we're going to blow up the, uh, the, the famous um, uh, cave paintings at Lascaux in, in, in France, because we want to build a mine there. We'll ask the local villagers if they agree, <laughs> and then we'll blow it up. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, you know, we, we all have to start to stand up for indigenous traditions, indigenous rights, uh, uh, because it's part of the, the sacred heritage of the whole of humanity. So anyway, that's a little note to finish on. Can I thank, um, can I thank particularly Chels? Chels, this was, Chels came on saying, I'm very unprepared. <laughs> I thought, wow, I'd hate to see a session where Charles was prepared. We'd be here all night, I think. Um, in fact, I'd love to see a session where Charles, Charles was, was, was fully prepared. And uh, so thank you so much. It's been a, a rich and stimulating uh, discussion. And thank you to you, Daniel, Jason, and Morag for your, as always, um, very insightful contributions to this discussion tonight. So next time, uh, the next uh, round table, the last in the series will be led by Jason and it'll be on regenerative urban design and development and planning. And in some ways, I think it, 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 uh, that session will draw together a lot of the threads that we have been exploring in these in these uh, four round tables so thank you everyone thank you to the participants and um, stay safe and stay well thank you Ken. <laughs> good night thanks thank Ken. thanks Charles. Thanks, thanks, thanks for everyone for your contribution it's always good to learn from you <laughs> see you bye bye good night Yada Martha Kell Halls, yada. you're absolutely correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <yada>, Gagu. <laughs>